This tutorial will show us how to work with problems involving blocks sliding down hills when friction is involved. The first thing to do when working with any force problem is to define a coordinate system. Usually our coordinate system has x going to the right and y pointing up. The trick about working with hill problems is that we realize that we, hey, we get to play God in these problems and we can define our universe in whatever way we like. So it's very useful to rotate our coordinate system where x is up the hill or down the hill and y is out of the hill. This has two advantages. One is that we'll see later on when we draw our free body diagram that most of our forces will be in either the y or the x direction. And second, it puts our acceleration in this case, even actually our complete motion, only in the x direction where there's actually no motion, no acceleration in the y direction at all, which makes our problem solving easier later on. So I'm going to define x is up the hill and y is out of the hill. So the next step is to draw a free body diagram. We have our mass m. The force is acting on the mass. There's a normal force, a surface force, coming out of the hill. There is a gravitational force acting straight down towards the center of the Earth. And in this case, our relative motion of this block is going to be down the hill. So we have a friction force that's going to be acting opposite that direction of motion. So there's going to be a friction force acting up the hill. Now, from this free body diagram, we can write a couple of equations. We always start with, we're going to write a summation equation that has all the forces acting in the x direction and an equation that has all the forces acting in the y direction. Now before we begin, we have to make sure all of our forces are acting either in the x or the y direction. In this case, our normal force is acting in the positive y, our frictional force is acting in the positive x, our acceleration is in the negative x, so those three are fine. The issue is though that our gravitational force is actually acting in between x and y. So we'll have to break it into components. Again, components are just another way of representing a force. So I'm going to break my gravitational force into a y component. Remember, this is not straight down y. It's my y direction component. So fgy, sometimes known as figgy, and an x component of fgx. Now if I rewrite my gravitational force in terms of fgy and fgx, all of my forces are in either x or y. So I'm ready to fill out my summation equations. In the x direction, we have the friction force. In the positive x direction, we have the x piece of our gravitational force in the negative x direction. And this is going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object in the x direction. In our y direction, we have the normal force pointing up. We have the y part of our gravitational force in the negative x direction, or negative y direction. And that is it. And this is going to equal the mass of the object times the acceleration in the y direction. And now because of the way we picked our coordinate system, there is no acceleration in the y direction. There is no change in motion of this object in our rotated y direction as the block stays along the hill the entire time. So in our y equation, the ma side goes to zero. We're almost ready to solve these things. If we look through our problem, the couple last steps are we have to figure out how big these components of gravity are, or the gravitational force are, based on our problem. If you look back to our free body diagram, if you do a little bit of geometry, you can just realize that the angle of the hill, the angle of theta, is the same as this top angle when we broke our gravity force into components. So knowing that, we can say the y part of the gravity force is equal to the total gravity force, which we know from previous lessons is equal to m times g, where g is our gravitational constant of, in this case, we usually use 10 newtons per kilogram. So we can say the y part of the gravity force is mg, and since it's adjacent to the angle cosine of theta, the x part of our gravitational force is going to be m, then mg times the sine of our angle theta. We also have the idea of what friction is. So we can always say that the frictional force 
is equal to the coefficient of friction mu times the normal force. And now if we substitute a bunch of these things back into our equations, we can rewrite our summation equations as if we use mu times normal force for friction, we have mu times normal force minus for the x component of the gravitational force, we have mg sine of theta, and this is going to equal m times our acceleration, and I'm going to leave off the x because we know that all of our acceleration is in the, y, is in the x direction. If you look down at our y equation now, they both of the forces have to balance out to be zero, so we can get that our normal force is equal to the y component of gravity, which is mg times the cosine of angle theta. And now we can substitute our normal force that we just found in our y equation back into our x equation and rewrite our x equation as some of the forces in the x are going to be mu. Now for the normal force, I'm going to use mg cosine of angle theta minus mg sine of angle theta, and this is going to equal m times a. At this point, something nice happens. When there's no applied force acting in this system, all the masses will cancel out in this equation, which tells us that the acceleration of this block does not depend on the block's mass. You can kind of think about it as the more mass of the block is, the more friction there's going to be acting on the block because the bigger the normal force is going to be, but there's also more gravitational force acting on the block, so they all cancel each other out and you get the same acceleration. And if we just do a little bit of reorganizing, we can get the acceleration in terms of other variables that the acceleration of this object is going to be equal to. I'm going to pull one of the g's out equals g times mu cosine of theta minus sine of angle theta. Now this is a very interesting result because it one thing tells us that the acceleration is going to be um, a fraction or a percentage of the gravitational um, acceleration when the object would be in free fall. It also tells us what the limiting factors are when this block actually slides or not. Again, we know that the acceleration can actually be positive in this because the friction force has a limit to it. So in our case, negative is down the hill. So when this value here, when mu cosine theta minus sine theta is negative, which means when sine theta is bigger than mu cosine theta, this object will slide down the hill. It'll have an acceleration down the hill in this case. If mu cosine theta is bigger than sine theta, this term will be positive, and our object here will have a positive, or this will say our object has a positive acceleration, but we know that can't be true because in this case, the friction forces wouldn't be as high and the block won't slide at all.